All right, well, welcome, everyone. Uh, real briefly, I'm going to do a couple of the announcements here. And uh, of course, I would prefer if, you prefer if you would turn off your cell phones, of course. I would greatly appreciate that. Hopefully, mine's turned off. I think it is. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Wisdom Wednesday, that would be tomorrow, right here at the museum. Uh, Ali members and guests are invited to attend a Wisdom Wednesday presentation from 2.30 to 4 p.m. Uh, this Wednesday, April 24th, Dr. James Birdsong will present Auburn Aviation Flying into the Future. Of course, that is a regard to our uh, very good program that we have with Delta Airlines. And uh, another thing I just want to mention today on this one is that there is a book exchange at Sunny Slope, which is going to become no longer a book exchange. So if you would like to stop by Sunny Slope and uh, peruse the uh, bookshelf and perhaps take a few home, uh, please feel free to do so because we are going to then, if they're not all taken out, donate the rest to the Auburn Library. So if there's something there that you would like to read, please feel free to go over there and grab one. Okay. Today, we will be talking about the making of the atomic bomb and the B-29 superfortress. Now, just so you all understand, I am not a physicist. I am not a scientist. I'm certainly not a mathematician. I can barely keep my golf scores straight. So I'm going to do the best I possibly can with this lecture. Um, a couple of things. Uh, I highly recommended a book in my uh, syllabus called The Making of the Atomic Bomb by Richard Rhodes. It is a wonderful book, uh, and it's certainly very, very uh, detailed. And I think that if you, in fact, I've read it like four times. So it's really good. The other thing I wanted to mention before I start, really, is I sent everyone an email. If you did not get my email, please take a minute before you leave today, and if you'd like to get my emails, uh, and write your email address on my sign-up sheet. Uh, on the back is fine. And that way I will have a copy of your email, and I can then uh, send, because I do intend to send some more, particularly after this lecture. So, another thing you may all have noticed is I am incredibly fascinated with how times have changed, how science and things developed so much more rapidly in the late 19th and early 20th century, and today even, of course, uh, that progress is just being made at such an incredible time. Uh, for example, real quick, Robert Goddard, in 1926, makes his first liquid fuel rocket. It's a little tiny liquid fuel rocket. 18 years later, the Germans are using intermediate range ballistic missiles, the V-2, to bombard London and Antwerp, for example. So you can see in just that little short time, we've gone from this little tiny rocket to uh, intermediate range ballistic missiles. And of course, by 1969, we put a man on the moon using that same technology. So I, the things just went so super fast. And the atomic bomb certainly falls into that category. Now, the question is, back then, what is an atom? And we look at this picture of an atom, and we see a nucleus, an electron, and a proton. Now, this is a very simple version compared to what we know an atom is today. For example, there's no neutrinos, no quarks, no antineutrinos that are in this picture. Because this is the picture we probably all grew up with in grade school. This is what you thought an atom looked like. So this is, wasn't even thought of, really, uh, as what an atom was at the turn of the 19th into the 20th century. So the first thought process in 1904 was this atom. And they called this atom the plum pudding atom. It was by J.J. Thompson. And what they had figured out was that uh, atoms were uh, negative, had to be negatively charged. So what they would have to do then is for some, in order for the charge to equal out, there had to be some sort of positive charge. Well, Rutherford, or Thomas, excuse me, comes up with this idea that they must have been floating in like a 
cloud, let's put it that way, of positive energy. And because this cloud of positive energy does resemble the fine British dessert of plum pudding, it hence had the name the plum pudding atom. So again, we know better now, but again, in 1904, they had really no idea what an atom was. So then we come with the Rutherford atom. And many of you may be familiar with uh, Rutherford. He is considered to be the father, father of modern physics. And in 1911, he comes up with this idea. Well, how does he come up with this idea? He comes up with a very famous experiment. He sends alpha particles through a piece of gold foil. And then there is a thing called a, a cloud chamber, right? So you got to realize how primitive this technology really is compared to today. And a cloud chamber basically is a, a mist. So when things go through this, they can see them going through this vapor. And they didn't have the capability to actually count these things or these events. So someone would sit there and stare at it. And you would stare at it for probably 20 minutes to half an hour. That's as long as you could go. And then someone would come in and replace you so they could, and they would literally physically count the events. So the Geiger counter wasn't available. And even the Geiger counters that lit just slightly after this time were so primitive, they couldn't differentiate between numerous things. So anyway, what he finds out, Rutherford does, is that when these alpha particles are going through the gold foil, a few of them are scattering. They're not going straight through. So if it was the uh, Thompson or the plum pudding uh, atom was the correct model, they would go straight through the atom and not be disturbed. Well, these are being disturbed, so they're hitting something. Well, what they're hitting is, in fact, the nucleus. So Rutherford, in effect, just decides that there must be a nucleus inside the atom. And uh, it's not made up, ultimately, of a single particle in a cloud. It's actually made up of multiple particles. So what they come up with by counting is that the size of the nucleus is incredibly small. It's the size, the equivalent quick, is a simple way to put it is, if you have a football field, that's the, that is the atom. The nucleus of that atom is the size of a grain of sand for a very simple uh, type of atom. Now, if it's a uranium atom, which is a much more larger nucleus, it would be about the size of a marble. So you can see that Rutherford has now made a huge breakthrough into what we're coming to be, what we know of as an atom. Well, there's a problem with that, because if these electrons are going around this nucleus, why don't the electrons, because they're losing energy in classical physics, Newtonian physics, they would lose energy, and they would crash into eventually back into the nucleus. So he has to come up with a reason why this doesn't happen, because, for example, none of us would exist if this did was the case. So the fact of the matter is he figures that there are stationary orbits, and things don't change as long as the electrons stay in their own stationary orbit. Now, that's a pretty big jump of, of how to get to that point from that, from the point of crashing in, which Newtonian physics, to this new type of physics. And what they use is they use Planck's quantum theory of radiation. And furthermore, Heisenberg then decides that he has to come up with a thing called quantum mechanics. And the simplest way I can describe quantum mecha mechanics is it's a, basically a statistical form of physics. So on the simplest level, if we all exist, then indeed atoms must be stable. Otherwise, we wouldn't exist. So, that's where they come up, and that's 1913. And all the way, by the way, all these people are winning Nobel Prizes for this work. So we still don't know any more that there is a proton and an electron. Nobody has yet to find the neutron. 
And the neutron is discovered by this man, James Chadwick, and that is all the way in 1932. So James Chadwick hears about a uh, scientific experiment done by the uh, Jolie Curries, and that's Madame Curry's daughter and her husband. And he hears about the experiment that they're doing, and it just doesn't seem right to him. Something's wrong about the way they're thinking about their data and what their results are. And so what he does is he takes polonium and he makes a, a beryllium target and he fires this thing at a piece of paraffin wax. And it's displacing protons. And he's going, well, there's no way that gamma rays could possibly move a proton because the proton would be too heavy. So something else must be moving that thing. They use an oscilloscope and they can see that this is occurring and consequently what happens is, is he makes the decision that since protons are too heavy, it must be caused by an uncharged particle and hence he discovers the neutron. But some people are not particularly buying off on this theory. Well, once again, Niels Bohr and Heisenberg basically come to the rescue and they consider that the neutron must be a separate subatomic particle and not uh, what they were thinking was it was a proton-electron pair that was causing this. So it's not a proton-electron pair, pair that's causing this. It is a new particle altogether that is yet to be discovered and that particle is indeed the neutron. So now we have to our original primitive atom that we showed at the beginning of this, the three parts of the atom as we knew it as probably kids. Well, I told you about the fact that they were using pretty primitive equipment. So if you look at Rutherford's laboratory, this is actually the laboratory where uh, <laughs> they made a lot of these great discoveries, including the neutron, because Chadwick worked for Rutherford. And you can see there's no computers. Uh, if you wanted to make an experiment, you literally built the experiment yourself. You would know how to blow glass, for example, if you needed like little tubes. So physicists back then had to be kind of like mechanics almost, or craftsmen would probably be a better term, that they would have to build things themselves. They would come up with an idea for an experiment. They couldn't just go to the store and buy something. They didn't have computers and they would just come up with this stuff and then make this stuff themselves and that is just amazing to me that that little primitive laboratory is where these great discoveries are coming from. And also keep in mind that the amounts of stuff they're using, like polonium, they're probably using a hundredth of a gram. There's, these are little tiny quantities of what the materials they're using here. Well, that brings us to 1938 where we get to nuclear fission. And Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann, they bombard uranium with neutrons at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin. This is key. And the result is the element barium. Minute quantities of barium, but barium just shows up. And they're thinking, how the heck did that happen? Well, Lisa Meitner and her uh, nephew, Otto Frisch, they have escaped from Germany. Uh, they are living in uh, Sweden. And they, Lisa is very unhappy. She's, she's uh, been basically left all her furniture and everything behind. She doesn't have a job. She's in a really tough position. Uh, her nephew, again, has is, is escaped from uh, Germany. And they're both kind of just hanging around. They're kind of unhappy and down and out but they're still doing physics. And they start looking at this experiment that Han did, and they're going, it must be, somehow we must have split the atom. Well, because barium has an atomic mass that's 40% less than uranium. So how could you get with normal, you know, things break down over time, of course. You have uh, anything that's radioactive has, for example, a half-life. And they're well aware of that. 
But how the heck do you get from this to 40% less like that? And Frisch is like, oh, I don't think this is, you know, this can't be true. It's no way that this is possible. And Meitner says, you know what, I know Han really well. They were friends. And she goes, I know Han so well that she is, he is such a great chemist that he would not made this mistake. So she correctly interprets this that it is indeed nuclear fission. So how does that take place? Well, this is a very simple model, but if you think of a uranium atom, because the uranium atom is very large, or the nucleus is very large, and you think about it in regard to like a big drop of water. Well, a big drop of water is kind of wobbly, all right? And it's, it could separate. And what happens is that what holds the water together in a water drop is surface tension. Well, things that are electrically charged, like an atom, have less surface tension because the electricity basically negates that piece. So it, it counteracts that surface tension. And the uranium atom, being so large, uh, is able to overcome that. So basically, you've got to look at the uranium atom as being a big, overstuffed thing. And it's, it's, it's really not very stable because it's so large. Plus, it's slightly radioactive. It does have a half-life. So it becomes capable for that thing to be split by a single neutron. Now, that seems pretty easy so far, but it actually gets a little more complicated. So the term fission that we use today is actually in regards to the replication of single cell animals. And actually, uh, Frisch is actually the guy that comes up with this terminology to explain this event, event. So he actually invents the term fission for this piece. Well, there's also a bunch of Hungarians, and they're called the men from Mars, uh, Leo Szilard, uh, Teller, Wigner. It's pretty amazing that all these great physicists came from one little part of Hungary. So they kind of got this colloquial name of the men from Mars because it didn't make sense that this there'd be that much brain power in one little tiny place. But it's how it worked out. So Zillard has left Germany as well. He has first moved to England, and then he eventually moves to the United States because he can get a better job, basically, being a physicist. And he's, he starts to think, well, this must be fission. This must be how this works. So if we look at this, simple enough, if I've got a U-235 isotope, there's two isotopes, primary isotopes in uranium. One is U-238 and one is U-235. So if a neutron hits that big, heavy nucleus and it splits, that because it's become unstable, because it can't absorb that many more, then when that breaks up, it does two things. It releases an incredible amount of power, and it shoots off more neutrons. So if it can shoot off more than two neutrons, you can have a chain reaction. Simple enough. I'm sure pretty much everybody's aware of that, but we'll just go through it real briefly. But it's only U-235 that has this capability, not U-238. And there's a few other pieces. So it's pretty amazing that they managed to discover the only element known to man, naturally occurring element known to man, that's capable of fission, and that is U-235. So a neutron-driven chain reaction, like I said, it produces secondary neutrons. Uh, there's, if you can get enough multiple reactions, you are going to get an incredible amount of power because what holds an atom together is extremely powerful. Uh, the example I would use is that if you split one atom, you relief, release enough energy to move a grain of sand from one atom. So this is an incredibly powerful source of energy. And so in this time frame, 
they found out that they could either do one of two things. You could use fission to make heat, which you could then use to make electrical power, or if you could get that fission to go really fast and release all its energy at once, you can make a bomb. Well, Szilard has actually thought about this before the discovery that the, you needed uranium. And it actually has a patent with the British government thinking about the fact that you could use, if you could split an atom, you could create immense amounts of power. So he actually has a patent on this in 1934 uh, with the British government, and it's a secret patent. So they are, so he's way ahead of the curve on this one. Well, again, I keep saying that these things, this is kind of simple and it's, it's it's, I'm being too easy with this because there's another problem. U-235 will fission. U-238 will not fission. If you bombard uranium with neutrons, and again, they were talking about incredibly small quantities when they got the barium, it's very, very difficult for U-235 to get, capture a neutron because those neutrons are moving pretty quickly and fast neutrons, neutrons that are released particularly by fission, can be captured by U-238. So U-238 gets too many of these neutrons. So what they start coming up with the idea is, is that you need to slow the neutrons down so that U-238 will not capture them and only U-235 will capture them. So if you can do that, you will indeed have a lot more chance of getting a power source or perhaps a bomb. But really, this is more about how a reactor works. So a U-235 has an odd number. U-238 is an even number. It has 143 newtons and 92 protons. For example, a U-238 has 146 neutrons and 92 protons. And because of this odd number, it has a different uh, issue with electrical charge, I believe, and consequently it makes U-235 much easier to fission. Uh, and another item you can make, we make actually a thing called plutonium. You need a reactor to do that. But if you can make plutonium, again, it's again, it's an odd number, and that will also fission. But that item doesn't exist in nature. It has to be created by man. Well. How did they come up with this? And I think this is kind of interesting that Enrico Fermi is trying to do, and you may be familiar with Enrico Fermi, he is the man who invents the uh, nuclear reactor at, uh, underneath a stadium at the University of Chicago in 1942. And he is living in Italy at this time. And they do an experiment, they duplicate the experiment using a wooden table and then they duplicate the experiment using a marble table. And they get completely different results. And they can't come up with a reason why. How could this be that we're getting completely different results? And what the problem is, is that if you use the wooden table, you have a different type of moderator compared to using the, the uh, marble table. And so he figures out, amazing to me, that indeed, Slow neutrons are able to be captured by U-235, but not by U-238, just by the differentiation of the fact that he used two different tables. So if it's very possible that if Fermi had not used two different types of tables, there would not have been a bomb by World War II. All right, so the simple enough, in the war years, Okay, we're not talking about thermonuclear weapons that we're familiar with today, which are a fusion bomb, which is a completely different animal, though it does use these for a trigger. This is a fission bomb. So we're not using the power of the sun, we're using the power of splitting atoms, which is a vast difference in how things are producing power. But at this time, U-235 can be used to make a reactor, the amount that's in uranium. But if you can purify U-235, or if you can get your hands on some plutonium, Pu-239, 
and those will capture fast neutrons, well, now you can make a bomb. So, how do we do this? Well, Fermi and Szilard, they go to Chicago, and they start getting together to build the first nuclear reactor. And there's two ways to build a reactor uh, at this time. One is to use a product called heavy water. And heavy water is a deuterium product, uh, and it's pretty hard to come by. The major manufacturer is actually at Norsk Hydro in Norway. And the other way is to use very, very pure graphite. So what will happen is, is the neutrons come in, and they hit the graphite, or they hit the heavy water, and that slows them down. And then they're able to be captured by U-235, but they're going too slow to be captured by U-238. So you get a lot more flow of neutrons into this very small quantity that's of U-235 in U-238. So again, the tiny amounts. Well, they decide that if they don't have heavy water, they're going to make a reactor out of graphite, very pure graphite that doesn't have a lot of boron, because boron will capture neutrons. So they're now going to build this big reactor. It's big. You can see from the drawing here, that ladder, how big this thing actually is. And they're going to make it out of graphite and uranium in canisters, not U-235, U-238, uranium ore, as pure as they can get it. And they'll put rods in there to grab neutrons. So if you pull the rods out, the neutrons can flow, and it will hopefully cause a nuclear fission. Well, Fermi is making this thing out of these blocks of graphite. And those of you that have ever used graphite to do a lock, for example, to, to lubricate a lock, you know that graphite is nasty. It's messy. It turns your hands black. It's just a big pain in the butt, right? Well. Fermi and these guys are all building this thing, and they're filthy. And Fermi decides to refer to this thing as a pile. So today we refer to it as a nuclear pile, but he didn't exactly use that as a term of endearment. He was, it really was a big mess. Oh, and another interesting thing is that Zillard didn't really like to get dirty. Now Fermi was kind of a hands-on guy. He would get in there and he'd pile up graphite and get dig around. And Szilard was like, eh, I don't know, I, you know I'm too, you know, I, I got, I, I need to be thinking. I don't really need to be doing this. And after this, Szilard and Fermi never worked together again because, because Fermi didn't really like the fact that Szilard didn't like to get his hands dirty. Another interesting thing about the computer aspect is Fermi always carried a little six inch uh, slide rule. And he'd always be walking around with his little six-inch slide rule, you know, doing calculations to see how much more uranium they needed or when they needed to pull the rods out so they would actually get this thing to fission. But he does get it to fission. And what that means is he got enough neutrons going into U-235, even though U-235 is just a small percentage of this, he got enough neutrons in there so it begins to have what's known as a critical mass. And a critical mass is what this is really all about. You get a critical mass, you now have these guys fissioning and creating more neutrons. The faster you can get it to do that, the more violent the result will be. So again, at this time, you have a big difference because this type of reactor will not explode. What it will do, if you pull all the rods out and leave it alone, is it will do what we refer to as a meltdown. So a meltdown. If you were going to use this as a weapon, remember, it's huge. You'd have to put it in a ship. You'd have to sail it into the enemy's harbor. You'd have to pull all the rods out, it, let it fission, and then have a meltdown. And it would cause a lot of radiation, a lot of heat, and a lot of damage, but it will not explode. So it's not exactly uh, anything you would refer to as weaponized. So this reactor will do something else, though. It will make plutonium. How does it do that? The re release of fast neutrons by the fissioning of U-235 will now allow these neutrons to be captured by U-238. 
Uh, it will then break down slightly down. It actually gets a little bit bigger than 238. I think it's 240, 241 comet, somewhere in that range. But it slowly, it quick, not slowly, it quickly breaks down to, to plutonium. And plutonium is also incredibly fissionable. In fact, it's more fissionable than naturally occurring U-235. So consequently, you have this thing where you can make plutonium. But plutonium has one other great feature for our needs to make a bomb, is plutonium can be chemically separated from uranium. U-235 and U-238 cannot be chemically separated, so it's very difficult to get those into two different piles. But, but plutonium can be chemically separated, so it is much, much easier to use plutonium uh, for a weapon. Well, like I said, U-235, fast neutrons. Uh, you can, re if you get enough U-235 together to get a critical mass and you keep it tightly contained, you can use that to release all its energy at one time, which is what the little boy bomb actually was. It was a U-235 bomb. So it's the key ingredient to building this simplest type of bomb. Uh, but again, at this time, they had no idea how much U-235 they would need. They had no idea how this would explode. They had no idea what it, if it would even explode exponentially, which, of course, we know today. But they thought, well, maybe this wouldn't be much better than regular chemical explosives. And you're, it's going to be it's hard to get. And it's, it's not really very convenient to use this product because it's so hard to develop it. And the British, who are very much ahead of us at this time in this process, begin to do a lot of experiments. And they start to see that they'd actually need uh, much less U-235 than was originally envisioned to get an explosion. They begin to find out that, indeed, it's, it's, even though it's difficult, this can be done. And they're very, very afraid that the Germans will be first to do it. Well. Niels Bohr, who we talked about earlier, is still around. And he's like, if we try to do this, you would have to make a factory as big as a whole country in order to make this, to separate U-235 from U-238. This is going to be incredibly difficult. Well, the good old USA just happens to have the wherewithal to build the world's biggest factory. And there it is. That is K-25. That was in uh, uh, Tennessee, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And they not only build that factory, they build three giant factories. And what they're going to do is they're going to separate U-238 from U-235, or 235 from U-238, actually. Uh, and the problem with it is, is they're almost identical chemically. They are. But they only differ by three neutrons. That's the only difference. So it's really very, very hard to get these things to separate. And as far as pure uranium metal, not U-238 or U-235, but just plain old pure uranium metal, in the entire United States in 1940, there's only one gram. So this is not something that can be easily done. Well, the US is going to use multiple technologies because they're not sure which one will work. So they're going to use multiple technologies at the same time to try to get this to go. And the modern centrifuge, what we would think today that you would use to separate 235 from 238, has not really been invented. They do make experiments to make centrifuges, but it's actually German scientists after the war that are working for Russia that create the first uh, actual centrifuge that will actually separate these two. So, Thank you, Germany, and thank you, Russia, for letting those guys go, which we got the technology for free, which was a good deal. So what they're going to do is they're going to use three different other methods. They're going to use gaseous diffusion. In other words, you're going to take a uranium gas and try to push it through a filter. And this, the lighter gas, the three neutron less gas, will go through the filter easier. They're going to use liquid thermal diffusion, which is basically heating it up and separating it that way. And they're going to use a thing called a calutron. 
And a calutron is a cyclotron. Those of you that know, the cyclotron spins things and they crash into things. And they're going to use a, a modified cyclotron to literally make a U-235. Well, Bohr comes to the United States during the war. He escapes, uh, and the British fly him out in, a, in a belly of a mosquito bomber. And he comes to the United States, and he looks at these factories, and he goes, see, I told you, you needed to make a thing as big as a country in order to make this work. So he's, you know, they're just stunned by the fact that the United States has the wherewithal, has the excess capacity to even play with this. Because this is, you know, this, nobody knows it's going to work. And they just, we just build it. Well, just to give you an idea of the gigantic scale of this, they were going to use, the, to the calutrons need a large amount of electricity for the giant electromagnets that make the cyclotron or calutron work. Well, this thing is huge. So they don't have enough copper because copper is really necessary for the war. So they decide, well, we could use silver, which will also act as a, as a winding for these electric coils. And they go to the bullion depository and they say, well, you know what we need? We need 6,000 tons of silver. And the bullion depository guy goes, um, young man, <laughs> we do not issue bullion in tons. We only issue silver by the troy ounce. And so they take millions of troy ounces and make these windings. And then after the war, they melt it all back down and return it ounce by ounce to the bullion depository. So you can see the scale of this thing is gigantic. Well, how does a calutron work? OK, so again, U-238 is heavier than U-235. Again, it's only three, three neutrons difference. So if you get them spinning using electromagnets, what happens is, and let me point this out, is the heavier one will go to the outside. The lighter U-235 will go to the inside. Then you make a collector and you collect these things literally atom by atom. So it, it's, it's a pretty complicated process. So what we do is we use all three methods at the same time. Uh, so they'll use one method to get a little more pure, and then they'll use another method to get a little more pure, and then they'll finally they'll send it to the calutrons to get it really as pure as they can possibly get it. So at peak production, the calutrons, taking materials that have already been refined and processed, can produce seven ounces of nearly pure U-235 a day. In order to make a little boy bomb, it takes 322 days of production to make that bomb. So what they decide is, you know what, it would be a heck of a lot smarter to take purified U-235, use it to beef up the reactors, and the reactors will make plutonium, and hence why we really have plutonium today as being the, the primary weapon uh, material. But if you think about it, you go to work every day in the j largest factory in the world, and you go and you work all day, and you, you get done with work, and you go home, and you, you leave the factory, and you think about, well, what did we do? What did we make? But I didn't see any planes come out. I didn't see any tanks come out. I didn't see anything come out. In fact, a total year's production of the K-25 facility is the size of a small suitcase. So you work in the largest factory in the world, and indeed, nothing ever appears to leave the factory. Well, that gets us to the types of bombs. So a little boy bomb is a gun-type bomb, and I'll explain that. It used 141 pounds of U-235, which is way more than they needed, but they were uh, afraid it would, uh, the term is fizzle, and I'll get to that. So of that 141 pounds of U-235, so basically that's a year's production almost, uh, only one kilogram actually fissions at the uh, bomb when it's used at uh, Hiroshima and it produced an explosion of 12.5 to 15 kilotons. That's thousands of tons. So it's not like today's uh, bombs were, we're talking megatons. These bombs were not capable of that. And realistically, if you look at these bombs, they're a science experiment. 
The fat man bomb, which is pictured here, is the plutonium bomb. And the plutonium bomb, the core of that bomb is the size of a small orange. This product is so incredibly dense that that small, by the way, it's hollow, that small orange sized ball weighs 14 pounds. That weapon was capable of putting out 18.8 .8 to 20 kilotons of TNT using something the size of an orange. Now, I should bring one other thing up in, to mind. And let's go to the next picture and I'll get to that. All right, there's a little boy bomb. The little boy bomb is basically a gun. So here's the explosive charge, here's the shell, and here's the target. When you put the shell and the target together, they're both U-235, they will cause a critical mass. They have a tamper to keep the neutrons in as tight as possible because you can't, the more the neutrons stay together, the more they can fission material and the more explosion you will get. Now, they thought they needed to have an extremely high muzzle velocity for this gun. So they thought this gun was originally going to be 17 feet long. It's a mighty long bomb. But it, that's what they thought. And what happened is, is they started doing more work. Again, the British uh, do this work. And they come up with the fact that, well, they, it does need a gun, but it doesn't need to be that much muzzle velocity. So they decide that they can make a different bomb. So the first bomb was called Thin Man, theoretically named after uh, Franklin Roosevelt. The plutonium bomb was named Fat Man, theoretically named after Winston Churchill. But they decided that they didn't need a 17-foot long bomb, that they could make a shorter bomb, and they really renamed that little boy. So now, one thing I didn't mention and I need to get to is inside that either plutonium or U-235, they have a thing called an initiator. To this day, initiators are secret. They are believed to be uh, polonium and tungsten, or beryllium, excuse me, polonium and beryllium. And inside that, it's probably, they speculate, it's about the size of a golf ball and maybe dimpled like a golf ball. So inside this target here, not just is it U-235, but there's also an initiator, which will shoot out a bunch of extra neutrons so you'll get that much more fission. And the, that's the whole secret of this. You've got to get it to fission really, really fast so it will explode and not just fizzle. All right, so now they need a gun. And they go to the uh, U.S. Army, and they tell the U.S. Army, you know, we need a cannon, and it needs to have this kind of muzzle velocity and, you know, X, Y, Z, and, you know, they can't really tell them why they need it. So they go, okay, we'll make you a cannon. So they come back with the specifications. And the cannon is really heavy. And they're like, why is this cannon so heavy? This is, this, this is way too heavy. We can't put this thing in this bomb. And then it kind of dawns on them that the fact that the thing is so heavy is that the army makes cannons that you can use over and over again. Well, needless to say, this cannon is only going to be used one time because it's going to vaporize. So, they go back to the drawing board and go back to the army and say, well, you know, we don't really need that good of a cannon. We need kind of a crummy cannon, actually. So they end up with this guy. All right, so that brings us to Fat Man, which is a vastly more complicated weapon. And why is it more complicated? I have a hollow core of plutonium the size of a small orange with perhaps a golf ball inside of it. Don't know. And I need to squeeze that, but I need, because it's plutonium, it needs to be squeezed much, much faster. Gun isn't going to work. A gun's going to fizzle. It's not fast enough to get it to squeeze. So how are they going to do that? Well, they're going to, without computers, without ever having thought of doing this before, they're going to use explosives as, an, as a precision instrument. They're going to use explosive lenses to squeeze that piece of plutonium to critical mass in a matter of seconds. Not even seconds, billionth of a second. 
and that will indeed create the capability to explode. So back at Los Alamos, they're using pieces of pipe because they figure if they can get it to squeeze a piece of pipe down, they can use that technology then to get it to squeeze in a 360 degree circle. So for a year out at Los Alamos, they're blowing up pipes and blowing up pipes and they're really struggling with this. And what happens eventually is, is they bring in, and those of you may remember these things, an IBM punch card machine because the calculations are so difficult they can't do them manually any longer. So now they start to run calculations for this on an IBM punch card. And unbelievably to me, they managed to get this to work. So now they've turned explosives into a precision instrument that can squeeze this thing tight without any leakage using <laughs> plastic explosives. So I think that's pretty amazing. So what happens with this bomb is if you squeeze that down super fast, you'll get a huge explosion. And with that, we're going to take a very short break. So now we have the plutonium bomb. So we know how this puppy works, right? It blows up, it fires explosives to squeeze a plutonium core that squeezes it. The initiator pumps it full of extra neutrons and it blows up big time. Okay. Well, how did this all start? Why did the US and Britain and all these other, you know, the allies in effect and all these physicists make such a huge effort to make an atomic weapon? Simply enough, they were terrified that particularly the, the Jewish physicists that escaped from Germany and, and occupied Europe were so terrified of the fact that the Germans would get the bomb first. Now let's keep in mind, indeed many of the great physicists have left Germany, but they still have Heisenberg, they've got Wiseacre, they've got Hahn who made the first, you know, fission, uh, and They've got all this capability with Strassman, okay, with Hahn as well. And so three of these four guys are Nobel Prize winners. So these are very, very talented people that are fully capable of making a weapon. Remember, the cat's out of the bag once you discover fission. It's really, it's, uh, it's impossible to keep this a totally a secret. It's not easy to make a bomb by any means, but the fact of the matter is it's no longer a secret. Well, Leo Szilard, Teller, and Wigner, again, the men from Mars, um, they are terrified that the Germans are going to build this thing first. Szilard reaches out to Enrico Fermi in Italy. By the way, Enrico Fermi, just so you know, um, his wife was Jewish. And when he sees that the Italian government is becoming to crack down on Jews, he makes the decision that he has to escape from Italy. He has won the Nobel Prize, and he has this money from winning the Nobel Prize, but he knows that he can't take it out of Italy, so basically he hides the money and ships it to the United States, and then he pretends he has to go to a conference or something, and he gets out of Dodge or out of Rome and gets to the United States. Well, he's so paranoid of uh, losing this money that he's won for winning the Nobel Prize that he actually buries it in his backyard. So <laughs> these people are frightened. Well, Zillard reaches out to Fermi and says, please don't publish this information. He reaches out to the Jolie Curry team and says, please, please do not publish this information because the Germans could get the bomb. Well, the Curries have a partially German team. And remember, the Curries were basically unhappy more than one time, actually. I didn't go into all the details, but they have been so close to major breakthroughs, and they always just slightly misinterpret them, or are they just a little behind the time, you know, they're, they're right on the cusp of winning Nobel Prizes, and they never do. And they decide that they are going to publish in Nature in April of 39 the fact that when you split U-235 it emits three neutrons. Well, of course, if it emits three neutrons, it's then 
vision is a reality. So they publish. Well, Zillard, and this is very famous, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, reaches out to Albert Einstein, who also reach, lives in the United States. He says, Albert, you know, and they actually are friends. He goes, you are so famous that you, if your, your name carries enough weight that maybe we can waken the U.S. government to this threat, and of course we can begin to make a bomb for the United States and beat the Germans from getting this technology. So Einstein writes a letter, and uh, he has a, they have a patron, and the patron goes to uh, Roosevelt, knows Roosevelt very well, and starts to explain this to him. So Roosevelt basically says, okay, we're going to start to try to make a bomb. Well, you get a bunch of military guys together from the Army and the Navy, and these are ordnance experts, and they come in, and they sit down with these physicists, and they basically don't think this is reality. They think this is like, you know, too far in the future to be worried about at this time, or too much, too much, you know, it's too impossible, really, that this could possibly work. And remember, things don't, nobody really knows how this is going to go. So they finally say, okay, look, how much money do you guys need? Well, one of the physicists, and I can't remember which one, uh, I think it might have been Wigner, goes, well, you know, if we had $6,000, we could probably get started on this. So they're like, okay, 6,000 bucks, no problem, guy, here you go, you got a check for six grand. So they leave the conference and the other uh, physicists are literally beating them over the head going, what are you, an idiot? Six thousand, we need way more than $6,000. But that is actually how the United States started this event with 6,000 bucks. So, in 39 December, Heisenberg has taken all this information now, and he has come to the conclusion that indeed a bomb can be made. And he tells the German War Ministry in 1939, remember the war started in Europe in September of 39, he goes, you know what, we can make an atomic bomb. Well, the Allies, like I said, has put all this effort, and of course the United States is the only country in the world that could possibly have done this, because the Germans really can't do it, because they need everything they can to make tanks and guns and planes. The British certainly can't do it. The Russians are way under way too much pressure to do this. But the United States has so much excess capacity that indeed we can make an effort to make this weapon. Well, we also want to prevent the Germans from doing this as well. And again, I told you the one source, the major source of uh, heavy water, which can be used as a uh, moderator for a reactor, is in Norway at this particular plant, the Norsk Hydro plant. And the Allies make a major, major effort to destroy this plant. Uh, the Germans never really thought to use graphite. They figured, well, we don't need to use graphite because, quite honestly, we've got all this heavy water. So we don't really need to worry about that. So numerous commando raids. The first commando raid made on this facility is a complete failure, and almost all of the commandos are killed. Two actually survive. They make another commando raid, and these guys manage to sneak into this facility. They attach small amounts of explosives on key parts. They touch them off and they get away scot-free. In fact, the Germans, the explosions are so muffled that the Germans don't even really know that they've been blown up. So it's not like the whole factory went up. They just put small amounts of charges on key parts. So they lose basically a year of production. Then, they begin to bomb this facility. And the Allies are very hesitant to bomb this because, of course, Norway is an ally. And they don't want to cause massive amounts of casualties to an ally. And this thing is hard to bomb because it's down in a valley. But they send numerous B-17s over, and they make a few hits, but they're hitting the town, and it's getting to be a mess. And the Germans now are also to the point where, OK, this factory is too vulnerable, we need to move it inside Germany 
where we can control it. So they begin to disassemble the factory and they take all the heavy water that they have made and put them on a uh, ferry boat that goes across this lake. Well, the Norwegian uh, commandos, uh, resistance, whatever you would like to call them, decide that they're going to attach explosive charges to this little ferry and when it's going across the lake, when it's in the deepest part, and this lake is pretty darn deep by the way, it's like a thousand feet, um, they set these things off in the middle of the lake that, and the Germans lose all their heavy water capability. Uh, unfortunately, quite a few Norwegian passengers die on that ferry as well. So, but they made a decision to do that. So the fact of the matter is, is the Germans never ever really devoted a serious effort to make a, a nuclear bomb. They really couldn't afford to do it, to take the risk that we could take to build something like this. But that does no way diminishes the bravery that these people had to go and try to destroy that factory in Norway. So they certainly, uh, again, their effort should be uh, applauded even though that they, uh, it really didn't have much effect on how the war occurred. So, well with that, I have a key question for the class. And the class, what was the most expensive single project of World War II? B the B-29. Yes, indeedy. It cost $2 billion to make the bomb. It cost $3 billion to make the B-29. Yes. Oh, yeah. Again, only the United States could do this. Okay, the other countries did not have the capability to do what we can. But this plane, now that is one darn nice looking plane for World War II. Notice the long, slender wing, uh, the streamlined body. A wing like that has got a couple of really great features. A wing like that will give you incredibly long range and incredibly high altitude. Uh, and of course the plane is very streamlined, it doesn't have a lot of lumps and bumps, and it's consequently a beautiful weapon, really. Right. Yes? I've heard people call it the Betty Grable of Bombers. Uh, did everybody hear that? It was referred to as the Betty Grable of Bombers. I think that uh, Betty Grable was known for long legs, I believe. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, it is a, a fantastic aircraft. Let's look at, contrast that with our famous B-17G. This G model is really the last major production model of the B-17. Notice the big thick wing. It has uh, turrets that are uh, causing a lot of drag. It actually has an opening to, to the outside where a guy would stand there with a, a M250 caliber machine gun. So that's not exactly the most uh, streamlined thing to do is to put a big hole on the side of an aircraft, but that's what they did. And so consequently, it was much, much less uh, effective as far as range and everything, we'll talk about that, than the 29. So the 29 actually is, comes from a 1939 uh, specification, so well before we entered the war. Uh, it was designed to be incredibly long range, and the thinking was, is we needed a weapon system that would fly from North America, I didn't say the United States, Canada, uh, it could fly from North America to Europe and bomb Europe. And their thinking was is perhaps if England fell to Germany, we would have the capability to continue the war from the United States and basically get away with Scott Free at this time. So, uh, the person that was actually a, a, someone that suggested, and he has, gets a very, very bad rap, I think, uh, is Charles Lindbergh. Yes, he was viewed as a Nazi sympathizer. Yes, he thought the Luftwaffe was better than uh, the British uh, RAF and our, our Air Force as well. Uh, and he had a couple of good arguments for that. But the fact of the matter is, he is one of the people that said, we need this type of aircraft. And he was a proponent of it. So what is the specification for this aircraft? They wanted a plane that would have a 20,000 pound bomb load. 
it would fly at 400 miles an hour, and it would go to a target 2,667 miles away and then be able to fly back. That's a mighty ambitious aircraft for 1939. Let's contrast that with the last version of the B-17. The B-17 had a 6,000 pound bomb load. It could fly to a target 1,000 miles away and it would fly at a maximum speed of 287 miles an hour. So you can see, this is a huge attempt at a leap in technology. Well, they didn't quite get what they wanted. They got a 20,000 pound bomb load. It could hit a target that was 1,700 miles away, and it would fly at a speed of 357 miles an hour. So it was pretty darn good. I mean, it really went pretty well, considering what they had to work with. Well. It's closer to a modern jetliner in appearance and certainly design than it is to a World War II bomber. It's the first bomber to have a pressurized cabin, so you didn't need to wear an Arctic suit and electric underwear and freeze to death inside this aircraft when you were at high altitude. It actually had an analog computerized gun system, so there weren't men in turrets or men standing in the window with a machine gun. They had little blisters where they could see out, and they used a computerized system to use the gun turrets automatically. Because it could fly at 32,000 feet, that's a service ceiling. Uh, and the B-29 was really difficult for the Japanese because it was fast and flew at such a high altitude. In fact, the early Model Zeros were about 30 miles an hour slower than a B-29. So they had a difficult time catching it, let alone shooting it down. And as most Boeing products of this era, notice I said this era, we're not going to talk about current ones, uh, most Boeing products were incredibly sturdy. They could take a massive amount of battle damage and get their pilots on their, their crews home. Well, see this picture? How good was that aircraft? That picture is of a Tupolev Tu-4. That is a Russian copy of a B-29. Several B-29s, I believe three, uh, were forced to land in Vladivostok, Russia, after fighting over Japan because they were damaged or out of fuel. And they landed, and the Russians, of course, kept the bombers, and then reverse engineered them to create this aircraft, which amazingly looks a lot like a B-29. So, that is the Tupolev Tu-4, which was, by the way, the Soviet Union's first strategic bomber. Well, it's a brand new airplane. It's got a lot of new technology. And it's got a lot of what we refer to as teething problems. And the biggest single teething problem this airplane had is the Wright R3350 engine. Now, I personally have a, a relationship with this engine. My mother, during the war, made counterweights at the Dodge plant that created this engine, so she made counterweight parts for this engine during the war. And there's no doubt in my mind that some of the engines that she, some of the counterweights that she made were on engines that flew over Japan during the war. So I have a personal relationship with this, what is in effect a very bad engine. So sorry, mom, your engine wasn't good. But the fact of the matter is, uh, it, it was a big problem. Why is this a problem? Well, what they did was they took two nine-cylinder engines and stuck them together to make an 18-cylinder engine. Well, when they did that, they didn't allow for heat transfer as they should have. So what would happen is this engine would overheat, it would leak oil, and it would eat valves. And it was so bad at overheating, now if you're going to remember, you're going to get the plane up to 32,000 feet with piston engines, you're going to have a long climb up there. That puts a lot of strain on these engines. So, every 25 hours, the top five cylinders had to be completely replaced. After 75 hours of operation, the entire engine was a piece of junk. So you had to junk the engine. I've seen pictures of uh, Tinian, Saipan, or Guam, I don't remember which, of a giant pile of these engines that had been discarded. So it was not a good engine. Oh, it had another problem. 
it had a magnesium crankcase. So when it did catch fire, the magnesium would catch fire, and then, of course, it would burn the wing off in a couple of minutes. That is not something you really want to have happening when you're trying to fly an aircraft. Well, so you can see the problems with this thing is more B-29s were lost to mechanical failure during the war than were shot down by the Japanese. Well, again, it's a new item. It's got all these new features. So when they were creating this thing, you can look at this picture, how many that are on that line. This is a very large factory making B-29s here. Uh, they literally would get them out of the factory and then would fly them to another area and they'd start rebuilding them and adding modifications because they were so buggy when they came out. <clears throat> but it's such an important program that theater commanders were not given control of these aircraft. They were directly controlled by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, Douglas MacArthur is very unhappy about this. He wants to control the B-29s to hit targets that he wants to hit. The Navy is not particularly happy about this. They want the B-29s so they can attack airfields in Kyushu to cut down on kamikazes that are attacking our fleet off of Okinawa. Uh, the Joint Chiefs say, tough luck. Uh, we are keeping these planes under our control. And why are they doing that? Is because the United States Army Air Force wants to become the United States Air Force. And they felt that if they could prove that this weapon was the war-winning weapon that we needed, that indeed this would indeed make it possible for the Air Force to be seen as a separate service, much like the RAF in Britain. And it would be uh, the air power now would be the most important branch of the military, not the Army and the Navy. All right, that brings us to the Silver Plate B-29, which is a little bit of a different aircraft. Uh, it does not have any turrets, except for a tail gun, and it's specifically designed to drop the atomic bomb. Uh, it also uses the term Silver Plate. So the 509th, and we'll talk about this in a later class, the 509th, when they needed something, they would go to requisition of whatever, and they'd go and say, well, you can't have that. You know, the, bean counters would say, you, well, no, you can't have that. And then they'd go, well, you know, this is for silver plate. And immediately they would get anything they wanted. That's how important the 509th bomb group was. So they had no defensive arm except a tail gun, like I said. They had reversible propellers to help them slow down when they landed. Um, a lot of changes. They had, for example, the right engine, instead of using carburetors, their right engines had fuel injection, so they were slightly more powerful. And they did a lot of things on this aircraft to save weight, to make it easier on those engines, to increase speed, and also the, the atomic bomb only weighs 10,000 pounds, which doesn't seem like only, but the fact of the matter is the plane is capable of carrying 20,000 pounds. And I had talked about the bomb bays. And the silver plate aircraft does maintain the two bomb bays of a typical B-29. B-29s had two separate bomb bays. Well, when they were going to make this thin man bomb, it was 17 feet long, it wouldn't fit in the bomb bays of this aircraft. So they were going to, to modify it to one big bomb bay, or then they wanted to take a British Lancaster, which had a bomb bay big enough to use the thin man, but the Air Force didn't really think too much about using a British aircraft to carry our bomb. And they were very, very pleased when they didn't have to completely redesign this aircraft for thin man and that it could use little boy instead. So they were really, really happy about that. So that brings us to the invasion of Saipan. And this isn't a great picture, but let's get so you can see here. If you look here, all those are B-29s, rows of them. There's one there. They're every. They're all over. This whole island is full of B-29s, OK? So what happens is we captured Saipan and Tinian, and we begin to construct air bases. And the Tinian air base, uh, and I'll, I'll bring you a picture of this. I was uh, I'm just, just there, actually. and. Uh, I'll show you what it looks like today in uh, one of the other classes. And 
It is like the world's largest air base. Now, what makes this so useful is the fact that these islands can be supplied by ship. We had also deployed B-29s that were staged in India, flew into China, and then from China could attack southern Japan, only Kyushu. They couldn't attack the whole country. But this, having these islands within range of Japan, we could now bring in ships full of bombs and fuel, and it made the whole thing much, much simpler. So we also captured Guam, which was a former US possession. And these islands, between the three of them, can, can, can have over 1,000 B-29s in service. And of course, they're easily supplied. Well, the Japanese begin to launch attacks on particularly Saipan because they are not happy about the fact that we are now bombing their country on a regular basis. And they're using Iwo Jima as a staging base. Well, the U.S. decides, you know, we don't like the fact they're bombing us. Also, on Iwo Jima, they're using it as a radar base so they know our planes are coming to Japan. So it's an early warning. And the other thing is that we could use that island, which is halfway between Saipan and Tokyo, as a place if a bomber is damaged, it could land. Uh, we could put escort fighters that are long-ranged, uh, P-57H and the P-47N, which are P-47N is specifically designed for the Pacific to be a very long-range fighter. And these aircraft from staging from Iwo Jima can escort our bombers and defend them. So that leads to the incredibly bloody invasion of Iwo Jima in February of 1945. But it's based, really, uh, the Air Force requested that so that the B-29s would be more uh, secure. Well, with the capability that we now have of an atomic bomb and the B-29 to deliver it, the entire nature of warfare has completely changed. That's what we're capable of doing. What is the Japanese response? The Japanese response is the balloon bomb. The way this worked is they would launch this thing up into the sky. It would catch the jet stream. It would take the jet stream across the Pacific. At a specific time, they would estimate the time. It had a few fragmentation bombs and a little incendiary bomb. And the idea was, that it would catch the fires, uh, catch fire to the forests of Canada and the northwestern part of the United States, and they would cause forest fires and it would be a huge problem for us. Well, again, it's just a little, tiny little bombs and you know, one little uh, incendiary device, and again, it's to start forest fires. It's made from rubberized silk, but they started running out of rubberized silk and began to make it with a thing called washi paper. And it was built mostly by Japanese schoolgirls. First one was launched in uh, November 3rd of 44, and uh, the last one was launched in April of 45. They launched a thousand of these at the US and Canada, and the US did consider them a minor military threat. They would, if they'd spot one coming in, they would send fighter planes up to shoot it down. <clears throat> Total casualties um, from this that are known was six people, a school teacher and five children. They were out on a field trip and uh, stumbled across one of these that had come to ground. It didn't release its bombs as it should have. It actually crash landed, and they believe one of the students was, began to fool with it and set off one of the bombs, and that killed the, uh, the teacher and the five children. Uh, the Japanese uh, Umezu, who we'll talk about later, uh, thought it might be a good idea to use this weapon to drop biological weapons on the United States, particularly plague. They, the Japanese were the world leaders in biological weapons. Emperor Hirohito says, no, we are not going to do this. And so they shelved that idea. And amazingly, because of the range of these weapons, until the Falkland Island War of 1982, 
this was the longest range weapon ever used because it was capable of going from Japan and they found them as some of them were found all the way like in New York so they would float all the way across the country and again they were completely ineffective weapon but if you compare what we're capable of doing making atomic weapons making B-29s and what the Japanese were capable of doing making this fairly pathetic balloon bomb you can see that they were in a very, very bad situation uh, as far as the war went by 1940, late 44 and into early 45. Well, just a little review on today. Unless anybody has any questions, do we have any questions? Interesting. Yes. Okay, the question is, did the physicists sort of know each other? Was there a worldwide group of physicists? And the answer is pretty much yes. There's not a, lots of them. I mean, there's not like tons of them. There's only a few major universities that even worry about these problems, like the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin, for example. In Paris, there's a, you know, there's, in Britain, there's universities of Cambridge, of course, uh, that work on these things. And all these physicists would go to, you know, they would get fellowships and they'd go to the other university and hang around and they had conferences. So yes, it was very, very common and many, many of these people knew each other. And they would come to these, I think they're like amazing myself. I mean, you think about, you know, people like Chandra Shekhar. I'm sorry? No video conferencing, no. They did not have video conferencing. But again, they would travel around and get together and, and, and talk. So anyway, uh, I think it's amazing that they were able to do this with what they had to work with. No computers, you know, a six inch slide rule. Uh, and in 35 years, they go from not even knowing what an atom is into making a bomb. Uh, they're ex their scientists escaped from Nazi Germany. It certainly, Nazi Germany would have been better off had they kept that brain power for their own uses. Uh, and it, they couldn't commit the resources, of course, we could. And, of course, we beat them to the bomb. There were two types of bombs created. There was the implosion bomb, or Fat Man, or the gun-type bomb, Little Boy. Uh, the U.S. is committed to the idea of strategic bombing. Uh, we developed the B-17, of course the B-24 as well, uh, but by 40 they've taken uh, huge steps to create a new bomber with exceptional speed range and bomb load, that's the 29. And I think the 29 is much more in appearance to a modern airliner than to a World War II bomber, and we'll see some more in, I believe, the next lecture. And, of course, it has a lot of teething problems. It's a kind of a dangerous airplane to be flying in. And the fact of the matter is, is we have built the first uh, explosive weapon of mass destruction. We have created, in effect, the, uh, as far as an explosive device, the perfect killing machine. And we've created something to carry it. So. It's changed warfare forever. The day we use those bombs, warfare changed. It would never be the same. So, as I said earlier today, if you would like to receive my uh, uh, emails, I am going to be sending out an email. It's called Voices of Los Alamos. It's uh, people that had worked at Los Alamos and they were recorded for posterity. Uh, so it's a uh, questions and answers and lectures and things that people that actually physically worked at Los Alamos did. And I'm also going to send out a very, very simple uh, version of how to make an atomic bomb, which may be easier to understand than, than, than my lecture today. So, yes? Me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Are you going to get into any of the espionage that went on at No, I am not going to discuss Klaus Fuchs. I am not going to excess the uh, glass uh, spy ring. 
Uh, we're not going to talk about the Rosenbergs, uh, no. But as I recommend, if you want to know about that, uh, Richard Rhodes, The Making of the Atomic Bomb, and his, particularly his second book, which is called Dark Sun, which is about making the hydrogen bomb, uh, we'll cover that in great, great detail. Yes? How many people work at Oak Ridge and how many people work at Los Alamos? Well, you've just asked the question I can't possibly answer. It was a lot less at Los Alamos. But you know what? We will start next week's lecture with that question. How many people worked at Los Alamos and how many people worked at Oak Ridge? A lot at Oak Ridge. All right. Any more? Thank you. Oh, we have more. Are we still using the B-29 as our main performance? The B-29? Oh, no. It's a B-58. A 50, 52. 52. Uh, 58's a hustler. Uh, no, we don't use, we haven't, we changed it to a B-50 by changing the engines. So it had more powerful engines and it would try to keep it up. And then there was another version, uh, Jim was talking to me about it earlier, where he put a couple of, uh, uh, jet engines on it as well to try to get it speeded up so they could use it for a tanker for uh, uh, refueling jet aircraft. But no, no more 20. There's only two 29s flying in the world right now. One is named Doc, and I can't think of the name of the other one, but you can take a ride in it if you want to. The second one is Fifi. Fifi, thank you. I couldn't remember Fifi's name. All right, we're done. My wife's telling me you got to go. <laughs>